So I asked in the chat, anybody has an idea, why do we need strain at all? And I mean, there are many possible answers. First answer is, I like tensors. That is the slightly fun answer. I like tensors more than vectors, but that is my personal problem. Uh, why do we need strain? Okay, the displacement vector field has a problem. Namely, it depends on where you are doing your experiment. Strain actually does not, and that is the, the major reason why we want to work with strain and not with displacement. Now, assume you do this experiment here, or you do this deformation here uh, on your table, like on your computer. <laughs> Uh, the displacement field is as I described it. If you do the deformation in a high-speed train, and I always have to make this joke, in Netherlands there are no real high-speed trains, so you have to go to Germany in order to do it in a high-speed train. I try to be funny here. Uh, and I'm not really funny because you have to go to Japan to really do high-speed trains, not in Germany. They are not that fast. Okay, so go to Japan into a real high-speed train and do the experiment deform this object from the dotted line to the solid line is the undeformed to the deformed operation. That will take you 0.1 seconds maybe. During this 0.1 seconds, the train has moved. So the displacement vector will be a very long vector because the train is moving to the right, for example. Okay, so the displacement vector field depends on whether you do it in a still laboratory or whether you do it in a slow train or in a high train or whether you do it in the space station. Okay, and that is not good. We don't want to deal with this information. We don't need this information because the material behavior does not depend on whether you do it in a train or on the space station. Okay, and that is the real reason why we need strain. And I should have started with that one. I just forgot it. Now, shear strain, that's like normal stress, shear stress. Now we have normal strains, we have diagonal strains, we have, they have the meaning of changing length in one direction. Now, normal strains are complemented by shear strains. And how do we get them? This is the subject of 4.2. How do I define shear strains? Now, we take the same point P and Q as before, nothing changed here, but we add a third point R and that one is dis distant from point P vertically up at the beginning. And in the deformed configuration, it is tilted also. So the lines delta L1 and the lines delta L2, they allow us to define an orientation or an angle or a, a relative orientation of the two line segments to each other. So we have chosen to take the one line segment in the one direction to begin with. We have chosen to take the second element in the two direction. So we know originally the angle will be 90 degrees between the two. They are rectangular. After the deformation, we cannot take this for granted anymore. The deformation will lead to a change of angles. And this is what shear strain is about. Change of orientation, change of shape. Normal strain was change of length. Shear strain is change of shape as I will show you mathematically now. Okay, new point R. There is still a Dutch word in my lecture slides. Wow, we missed one. Now, point R has a delta L2, but not in the first element, but in the second element. Okay, now, same as before, Taylor expansion using delta L2, and delta L2 corresponds to the second element, so we derive with respect to the second coordinate, not to the first as we had before. Okay, and we ignore higher order terms, nothing new, same trick. Now, we have to interpret the change of orientation, we have to interpret the change of angles. Okay, for the coordinates of the points P prime, Q prime, R prime, you can see the reader, or you can figure it out yourself. I mean, you, you have all the necessary information how to write it down. The shear strain, gamma 1, 2 now, is the change in angle, is defined as the change in angle between PQ and PR, that are the two line elements at the beginning, 
and how does this angle change? So the change in angle is the original angle minus the new angle. So originally it was pi half or 90 degrees minus phi is the angle between the vectors after the transformation. Okay, and vector, the first vector has a orientation change of angle alpha one, and the second vector has a change of orientation of alpha two. And note that alpha one and alpha two are not identical in general. They can be completely different. Okay, now we recall, we remember, we have to remember how to calculate an angle between two vectors. Okay, from PQ and PR, I know it's 90 degrees. Okay, from P prime Q prime and P prime R prime, I do not know the orientation just like that. So I have to remember that I use the inner product, scalar product, which is giving us the norms of the two vectors and the cosine between of the angle between the two vectors. Okay, so I have to calculate these two vectors, then I can calculate the cosine of the angle, and then I can calculate the shear strain. Okay, now if you remember your mathematics, uh, the cosine can be transformed in, into cosine of pi minus gamma half using the definition here. And the cosine of 90 degree minus another angle is just the sinus of this angle. This is a transformation rule for cosine and sinus, cosinus and sinus. Okay, so that's the only thing uh, which is new here. Okay, and now we are interested in the angle gamma 1, 2. We take everything inverted and that gives us arcus sinus of the inner product divided by the norms. So this is the sinus and that term here gives us gamma 1, 2. Okay, so basic geometry again, not yet tensor analysis or whatever. Okay, now, and just inserting all the definitions of the different vectors, we get again something which is partial derivatives. That's the only thing which is remaining. Now, remember, the partial de derivatives remain because we, we take these vectors as differences between two points. So the vector positions were obtained by differences, and that is why all the reference positions and reference velocities are disappearing. Only the partial derivatives are remaining, and that means the gamma 1, 2 will be the same when you are in your still laboratory, or when you are in a high speed train, or when you are in the space station. Same deformation gives you the same strain, independent of the velocity which your laboratory is going. Now, du1 dx2 plus du2 dx1, gamma 1, 2. Now, if you change the index, gamma 2, 1, you just exchange these two terms and it's identical. So symmetry in, is given for free for this definition. Gamma 1, 2 is equals gamma 2, 1, always. Okay, and this is now the geometrical interpretation again. One angle, alpha 1, corresponds to the derivative of the second component with respect to the first coordinate, and alpha 2 corresponds to the derivative of the first component with respect to the second coordinate. This is the interpretation of the two alphas, and they are evidently not the same. But by summing them up, we get something which is symmetric. So the partial derivatives are not symmetric, u1 dx2 u2 dx1 is not the same, but by summing them up, I make this object here symmetric. Okay. And this is the geometrical interpretation. Now, as usual, if you do it for the 1, 2 direction with symmetry, uh, you also can do it for the 1, 3 and for the 2, 3 direction, and that gives you the elements of the Non, on the non-diagonal. Okay, and again, we remember that for small derivatives, this is valid. For, we ignored the higher order terms of the Taylor expansion. Okay, now, in the index notation, all this can be summarized as gamma ij as the sum of the derivatives here. Okay, now, I do the break. 
before I have to test whether the strain matrix, which I just show you, is a strain tensor or it is not. Actually, we are not completely finished yet. OK, so this is end of section 4.2. Proving that the strain matrix is a tensor or making it a tensor will be the subject of section 